There's this, play, there's this place where Paul says, it is a trustworthy statement and deserving of full acceptance, that. And then he says something that's very true. I think in my case, it's a trustworthy statement and deserving of full acceptance that I never actually cover all the material that I have prepared. <laughs> there are some things that are for sure in this world. Let's look at, let's look at the uh, passage from Exodus first together. So uh, the name of this, this uh, passage, this Torah portion, in Hebrew is Vayakhel. Um, it's, it's taken from the first word where it says that Moses assembled the people of Israel uh, after this massive construction project that took them all winter to build this home for God in the midst of the people. And uh, they, they put the thing together. It was a group project. And this, uh, the Hebrew word here, Vayakhel, the root of it is kahal. Uh, kahal is the verb to, to gather, to get together to assemble. So we are kahaling here today. If I could use Hebrew, we're kahaling. Uh, we are at kahal. The Greek equivalent term for the Hebrew word kahal is ekklesia. We know that word, right? Ekklesia, which is usually translated as church. So in the Hebrew Bible, you have the word kahal, which is a gathering of people, an assembly. In the Greek in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where it says kahal, you have the word ekklesia, which in the New Testament is translated as church, usually in English. So if you're reading the Bible in Greek, the church is actually all over the Old Testament too. Moses gathered, quote, the church. It gives us some continuity for the people of God. Um, you know, it's just that it's translated into different words in English in most Bibles. In, in the Old Testament, it's translated as the assembly or the congregation. And then in the New Testament, it's translated as the church. So you get this like, dichotomy that it was Israel in the Old Testament and the church in the New Testament. But, but could it be that they're maybe a little more closely related than um, maybe what some people would like? <laughs> Who knows? So here's, here's the cool thing. What Moses did, Yeshua does. Moses was a prophet. Yeshua is a prophet. God said in the book of Deuteronomy, I'm going to send you a prophet like Moses. Listen to him and everything he says to you. And uh, according to the apostolic testimony in the book of Acts, that turned about, out to be Yeshua. Yeshua is the prophet like Moses. So there's some striking similarities here. Eh? So as we're reading through the Pentateuch, when we see what Moses did for Israel and on the world scene in terms of his interactions with Pharaoh, etc., that'll give us a real insight into what Yeshua is all about and what his spirit does through his body also. Because he's the, he's the head, we're the body. It's like we're an, you're an extension of Messiah in this world. Wow, that blows me away. Anyway, um, so let's, let's look at that. Actually, there, there's, a, there's a classic phrase in the Jewish tradition, uh, as it was with the former Redeemer, that is to say Moses, so it will be with the final Redeemer, the ultimate Redeemer, who of course we know is Yeshua. He is the, the final and ultimate Redeemer. So that, that's how you would uh, sum up that concept in, a, in that traditional Jewish phrase. Um, what does this tell us? It tells us that just like Moses kahaled the people of Israel, he gathered them as an ecclesia to build a place for the presence of God. What's Yeshua going to do? He's going to gather Israel to build a place for the presence of God. He is going to build his ecclesia. Is there any place in the New Testament where we read that, where we encounter this concept? Matthew 16. Remember, he, he gives the keys to Simon Peter, and he says, I will build my ecclesia. Yes, Acts chapter 2. Actually, that's the other verse that I had here. Um, Acts chapter 2, verse 47 specifically. We're on track here, brother. <laughs> it says that, the last verse, it says that the Lord added daily to the congregation those who are being saved. So who builds his ecclesia? He does. Yeshua does. Who saves people and adds them to his community of disciples? He does. He does, that's correct. What, what's our part in this thing? To obey? To tell the good news? Let his presence just flow through us. Yeah, let his presence flow through us? Absolutely. We, we see with the people of Israel, they, they obeyed. God said, do, it, do this, and when they did it, his presence came 
gloriously. You know, some people, when they look at the Pentateuch, they see a lot of wrath and people dropping dead all over the place and massive family dysfunction. I mean, some of the stories about Abraham and his extended family, they're pretty, they're pretty embarrassing. You know what I mean? Like, this is hardly a pristine family that has it all together or whatever. But when you, when you look at the Pentateuch from the, from the lens of the Holy Spirit, it is all about the glory of God. Like, the book of Exodus is about a glorious revelation. The book of Genesis is like building to that place where he can come and redeem his people and show himself to the world. I mean, it is all about the anointing, these chapters. Um, it, it, in that regard, like, Exodus is so relevant. Exodus is just crammed with new covenant dynamics, and I love that. So, think about this. Every Shabbat, when we get together, we're kahaling, we're like, we're an ecclesia, right? Who is it that brought us together? Yeah, that's right. It was him. So just think about that. The fact that we are gathered today is because he pulled us together today. Like seriously, every time believers gather, it's actually a miracle. It's Yeshua that brought them together. And that means if he's the one who pulled us together, then it's in his name. And he's the head. And I really, I really appreciate that. In um, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says... Um, don't give up getting together. Actually, the Greek, I love the Greek verb here for getting together. The Greek verb is like synagoguing. In Greek, he says, don't give up synagoguing. Because the synagogue is the place where you get together, right? So he says, like, don't give up synagoguing. Don't give up getting together, as some are in the habit of doing. On the contrary, encourage one another daily. And all the more as you see the day approaching. So... Uh, Hevra is uh, the Hebrew root chavar, means to connect or to join together or to be friends. So Hevra is like a uh, society. In Hebrew, it's like a society. It's usually a reference to a specific type of society that takes care of burying people and stuff. The, uh, the more common Hebrew word for like a group of friends in the sense of a discipleship group is a chavura. Chavura, like C-H-A-V-U-R-A-H. Chavura. Actually, we're going to be touching on, on, that, on that concept too. So did you notice here, there, 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 there are these two things that the Apostle in Hebrew says. He says, guys, don't give, up giving to, don't give up getting together. There are people who have a tendency to give up getting together, but don't do it. How come? Because we, we need to encourage each other, right? So it's like we're going to be doing one of two things. Either we're going to be doing the Lone Ranger thing and just giving up getting together, or we're going to be encouraging each other. And I don't know about you, but like, I need encouragement. Ask Genevieve. Like, I'm the type of person, encouragement makes me, it just makes me fly, you know? It's like when someone says an encouraging word to me, I feel so empowered to, to do what I'm called to do, eh? So, you know what? Maybe you don't need it to be encouraged. Maybe you're one of those, like, really strong people and you can just go for it all by yourself and that's awesome. Your love language would be words of affirmation, right? I think it would be one of them, yeah. For sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. But you know what? If you're not one of those people who need encouragement, that's, maybe it's because God has called you to encourage other people. Maybe you're one of those solid people who can just give encouragement. And you know what? There's someone out there who needs that. So don't do the Lane Ranger thing, you know? Let's get together. Let's encourage one another. It's powerful. I mean, sometimes maybe we'd be tempted to dismiss it, eh? Like, encouragement. I mean, that's just emotional fluff, right? Oh, you know, someone said something encouraging, and now I feel great. But it, it's, it's so much deeper than that. Like the Apostle, he places encouraging each other in, um, in antithesis to um, giving up on being the ecclesia. It's pretty hardcore, hey? John. If you really believe that the word says power of life and death is in the tongue, mm. then that is more than just, we're speaking. When we encourage people with our words, we're speaking life to them. Yeah. We're releasing the life of God through us to them. That's true. Yeah. So, you know, God said in the book of Leviticus, on Shabbat, have a holy convocation. Get together. It's just the bottom line, right? God says it. I love him. I want to do what he says. Um, here, here's another uh, interesting thing about, about the Sabbath. I like this. In uh, Exodus chapter 35, the, the header in, the, in my New American Standard Bible says, um, the Sabbath emphasized. So, like, he says it again. I don't know. This is like the fourth or fifth time he's like, encouraging the people of Israel to, to do Shabbat. And uh, he, he, he gives a little detail here that he hadn't given before. He says, uh, don't kindle a fire in any of your dwellings 
on the Sabbath day. That's kind of interesting, hey? Why did, why did he say that? I don't know. Have you ever seen like a, a movie like, um, is it Castaway? The, 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 the FedEx guy who gets, ends up on a, uh, stranded on a deserted island and he like has to make a fire and like, man, that's some hard work, you know? In the ancient times, you couldn't just flick your lighter and get that fire going or, or whatever. It was like, ch -ch 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 -ch. you know? Anyway, that's one of the things. I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you something kind of humorous. You know how Yeshua, he, um, one of the problems he had with, with um, some of the Pharisees was some of them had this tendency to ignore God's commandments and to focus on their traditions. And he had a real problem with that, right? Like, he really critiqued them for that. He said, you guys nullify God's commandments with your traditions. This is a problem. And uh, I I'm going to share with you a a an interesting little example that sometimes we can do in the, in the Messianic Jewish world. Um, I I've shared this before, but it's just, it's something worth repeating. Uh, in, uh, in the Jewish world, um, the Jewish people will, like, light a couple candles before sundown just to make sure they have some fire on hand so they don't have to light any fires. It's kind of a way of honoring the word of God or whatever, right? And I mean, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful tradition. You know, it means that you, you end up having this really nice candle at dinner every Friday evening. And I mean, really, uh, who doesn't like candle at dinners once a week? Unless, I don't know, like romance makes you uncomfortable or something. And then maybe you don't like candle at dinners, I don't know. But um, it, it's a beautiful tradition, but it's, it's meant to uh, guard the word of God, right? So a lot of Messianic people, they'll, they'll, they'll discover the beauty of the Jewish tradition and some of the ways of honoring uh, God's Sabbath and stuff. And they'll be like, wow, lighting candles, that's nice. So they'll, like, uh, they'll just, they won't really know the reason for it. So they'll just light them and you end up like the sun will go down and Shabbat will start and you'll end up lighting the candles an hour or two after sundown, like on the Sabbath. And it's just kind of funny because it's like, it's like missing the whole point, right? The whole point is like we light these so that we don't have to light fires on Shabbat. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, it, it's kind of a funny example of how sometimes we can even let our traditions replace God's commands, right? I mean, like, as you can see, I'm not saying this is like, I'm not making a huge deal of this, right? Just kind of giving a humorous example of how we all do it, man. Seriously, I'm sure every one of us in this room, we have our traditions and our ways of doing things that sometimes like override God's commands, you know? It's like the Mack truck of my tradition just rides right over the authority of the Word of God. And uh, maybe that's where we need to like blow up the Mack truck or something, I don't know. Or put the brakes on it, I don't know. So how about on a deeper level? Like, what's the spirit of the law with this? You know, obviously it's not about just avoiding lighting fires on Shabbat. Because really, like, I don't know, unless you smoke, you're probably not likely to light up on Shabbat anyway, right? So, like, what's, what's the deeper thing? Um, often, like, kind of lighting a fire can be a picture of, like, getting mad. I don't know, do any of you ever get mad? No. I get mad. Well, oh. and, and, and so sometimes it's a picture of that, hey? And so, like, you know how, like, on a deeper level, the, God's Sabbath is a picture of the rest that we have in Messiah, right? Like, Yeshua is our ultimate Sabbath rest. And that's something that we experience 24-7, not just on Saturdays, I hope. <laughs> and I just, I love that. I love how the whole concept of Shabbat, it communicates something so deep about the Gospel. Like, when we actually can rest in the Father's love, when our hearts can find that peace in Messiah and in His Spirit living through us, man, you just don't fly off the handle as often. Or if you do, like, it takes a lot more, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I've been on both ends of the spectrum too, you know, and I just, I don't know, I've, man, middle of winter, like right around now, I feel kind of edgy, seriously, right? I, I'm more prone to, like, get my ire up a little bit or whatever. But like, I just, I, 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 I know the days where I've spent quality time with the Father and He's filled me with His love because I just, it's like nothing phases you. You're just resting in Him throughout the day. You know what I mean? And I love that. I want to experience that more. And every, every week when we honor God's Sabbath, let's say if you do this, if you refrain from lighting fires on Saturday, that's what it's a picture of. It's like a physical picture of the Gospel, right? That's what all this stuff is about, I, I, I think. It's, it's like it's pointing to Messiah, right? He is the goal of the law of God. Yeah. Here's, here's something else inter interesting. In um, Exodus chapter 40, uh, we've been on, like, as we've been on this journey through the book of Exodus, we've been pointing out things where God says, this is something that is forever, Leolam. This is something that is for um, all your generations, throughout your generations. And... Uh, 
excuse me, interestingly, some of these things have been things that people, pop theology will, today will say, well, that's temporary, that was for a past dispensation, etc. And over and over, though, in the book of Exodus, God says, this is, th this is forever, this is throughout your generations. Here, here's an interesting example, and I just thought it was um, worth looking at for a sec. Exodus chapter 40, verse 15, he says, um, with regards to Aaron and his sons, in verse 14, you shall bring his sons and put tunics on them, and you shall anoint them, even as you have anointed their father, that they may minister as priests to me. And their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood throughout their generations. And uh, the Hebrew word for a priesthood is kahuna. Everybody say kahuna. kahuna. Yeah, like kind of think of the big kahuna, right? And you'll never forget it. The, the high priest is the big kahuna, okay? Um, the kahuna, and, then, and, and the word there for perpetual, translated here as perpetual, is olam. Like where it says that God is the everlasting God, it says that he is olam. Where it says that like eternal life, that phrase, that is olam. It's the same phrase here. So it's like there's something about the Aaronic priesthood that is not temporary. There's something about it that God says is leolam, that is throughout the generations of the people of Israel. Something to, something to hold in our minds and, and, and our theology. Here, here's, um, here's, I think, my favorite dynamic from these chapters. Like, okay, so, like, this is really embarrassing, right? Like, Moses is up there on Mount Sinai. The whole nation has just heard the audible voice of God. And, like, the mountain is glowing at nighttime. That's pretty impressive, eh? You'd think that that would be a good stimulus for faith. And yet here, like, the people are down on the main floor... Like, well, let's, you know, Moses is gone. Who knows what happened to the guy? Let's build an altar and get this thing going. Uh, get, build an, altar, uh, an idol, etc. Eh? And uh, that's kind of embarrassing. And then Moses, you know, he goes back up the mountain. He gets the second set of tablets that are based on the forgiveness of God, that revelation of his grace and his mercy, right? And, um, and then he's like, okay, I will dwell in your midst. Um, here, here the, here's the blueprint for the tabernacle. And uh, it, I just, it, it's been so refreshing after like this national fiasco with the golden calf, just to read about the people's response. They're so eager to obey. Like they just love the Father. They, they're willing to like just give him all the gold and all the silver they have and all this stuff, you know. And you know, in this, in this part, so they just keep bringing more and more until finally the foreman of the tabernacle project, you're like, Moses, like call them off. We have too much stuff, you know. This is enough. It's just, it's so refreshing. You know, and even it says Moses blessed the people uh, for that. I just, we've been talking about how that's such a new covenant dynamic too. You know, when the Spirit of God sets us free and he fills our hearts to overflowing with his love, it's just like, you just can go forever. You just want to give him everything, you know? There, there's such a freedom to it. And, and I love that, I love that uh, dynamic in, in this passage. So let's look at that for a second because it explains something about our congregation and our, our MO, like our modus operandi. In um, Exodus chapter uh, 35, let's look at Exodus 35 together. Verse 21, it says, Everyone whose heart stirred him and everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought Yahweh's contribution for the work of the tent of meeting and for all its service and for the holy garments. Then all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought brooches and earrings and all of these things. Did you notice that? They're like, it's, it's, it's a double phrase there. I think it's emphasizing something. It says, what does it say? It says, Everyone who's, those who, whose hearts stirred them, those whose spirits moved them. Um, Exodus 35, verse 21. Yeah. I just think, like, I, that, that, is our, that is our modus operandi in this congregation. Uh, you've noticed we don't have programs. <laughs> um, we're pretty lightweight. We're pretty streamlined. Um, that's not because we're against doing stuff, but often when you have a program, it begins with the program serving the people, and eventually the people end up serving the program and you have things backwards. And people end up volunteering because they have to, or because they feel guilty, or because, heaven forbid, that we would ax the program, you know? And um, I just, I, I see this dynamic, and I think it applies in general. Like, what is, your, what is he stirring your heart to do? What is he moving your spirit to do? 
uh, for his kingdom in Prince Albert, uh, in terms of how you serve the body of Messiah, in terms of maybe if you initiate something even in our community. I am all for that. Like, I encourage you 100%. I, I, I even think of us in this room, and like, I, quite a few of us are, are doing things for the kingdom because we're passionate about it. Because he, he has moved us in that direction. Uh, like, Hannah, I, I think of, uh, of the, the, the way you love the First Nations and you establish contact, and I can tell, like, this is something so deep in your heart. He is moving you in that direction. You know, and I, and, and I admire that. I, I, I think uh, John and Susie of the, the work that you're doing with children in your area and just how innovative and it is. And I think, wow, like, he, he's so, like, stirring your spirits with that, you know, and it's so fresh as a result. Or, or like, Gen- Sheree, I haven't heard much about it, but Genevieve said you've been going and doing some, some speaking on, on reserves and things. And it's like, it's the kind of thing you don't do because you have to do it. It's because you're passionate about it. Because you can feel Messiah's passion, hey? So I just, I just want to encourage us as a community, let's grow in that. Let's go for it. You know, if there is an area of passion in your life that you're not acting on, like, if not for your own sake, for the sake of the body, go for it. Because we need that. We need that. We need, we need fully functioning people who are doing what they're passionate about. Sometimes people will ask me, like, so how is your ministry going or whatever? And I tell them, I don't have a ministry. I don't do ministry. P- frankly, the word ministry really turns me off. I, it may be because I'm a pastor's son and a pastor's grandson. And I, I just, I, I've seen people do ministry where they, it's like, it's not even about the people. It's not about them doing it because they're passionate. It's just, they're, I don't know, list the other motives that you can have for doing, quote, ministry, right? It's, it just turns me off. So like, my, the way I work is I do what I'm passionate about. I do what, what, I, what is in my, like my heart's desire from Yeshua, right? That's why I teach Hebrew, because I love teaching Hebrew. It's why we're, we're here doing, doing this community in Prince Albert. It's because, like, this is what I live for, you know? I'm not, like, doing ministry. So anyway, I sorry, I just about, I, just, I hope I'm not venting too much with that. You guys are never going to ask me about ministry ever again, are you? No, I'm just kidding. I don't think any of you have. We don't really use that term. I'm not saying the word ministry is a bad word, right? It does mean service, but sometimes we miss that it means serving people and loving on people. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here's a, here's a really cool example of this dynamic. Um, in Exodus chapter 35, verse 34, it's talking about Bezalel and Aholiav. And um, it just says, He also has put in his heart to teach, both he and Aholiav, the son of Achisamach of the tribe of Dan. So um, in Hebrew it says, Ula harot netan belibo, and to teach he has given in his heart. That's where it's at, hey? It's like, what, what has he put in your heart to do? What has he given in your heart to do? Do that. Now, don't respond to, to should. Well, maybe I should do this or whatever. Just ask the Father, right? What do you want me to do? Can you move me in that direction? Yeah. So, and and you know, there's freedom there then we can do stuff willingly. We do it voluntarily because we want to. And it's fun then, hey? And then you know what? When you hit the tough times, you're going to make it because you know why you're doing it. That makes all the difference. You don't crumple. And I mean, you know, if you, so even in our community, if there's like an initiative you want to take, if there's something, a direction you feel like you'd like us to go in, let, let's communicate about that. Let's work together. You know, we're, we're a team. And uh, I, I value the dynamic in our community that we are lightweight, like we're mobile, we can be flexible, we don't do stuff because we've, quote, always done it this way, really. I mean, we've axed some stuff that we do, we've introduced some new things. Frankly, like, I'm reading a book right now, I'll share with you something, I, I started reading a book yesterday. It's been on my shelf for a long time and I felt prompted to start reading it. It's called Surprising Insights from the Unchurched by an author named Tom Rainer, and it's all these statistics from all these interviews he did with people who came, became believers in the last two years of doing that interview, and how they came to faith, what made the difference. And it is, it is really insightful, actually. And I mean, he, 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 he gives some really, really kind of depressing statistics almost. Like, you know, he says for every 85 church attenders in the United States, one person comes to faith annually. That's not a very high multiplication rate, is it? For every 85 people, one person comes to faith. And I think he said there are 4% of churches in the United States who, who bring more people to faith than that. And I just think like, man, I, 
I feel like he's, he, like, I couldn't go to sleep last night because I was lying in bed thinking about what I read and feeling challenged and thinking about, Father, what kind of changes do you want us to make, right? So, like, I'm, I'm, I'm open to just overhauling anything and everything as he prompts us because we have a mission, right? It's not about doing stuff because we've always done it this way. It's about what is our mission and what's the most effective way of accomplishing that mission, right? There's this one verse, Exodus chapter 36, verse 13, um, and it says... He made 50 clasps of gold and joined the curtains to one another with the clasps so the tabernacle was a unit. Can I hear an amen? amen. <laughs> I mean, at first glance, it's like, okay, he's like hooking this thing together, some golden clasps and stuff, right? Right over my head. What, how is that going to affect how I do life? I, I want to give you a little, I want to give you some insight into this verse because like in the Hebrew, it actually means a lot more and it's pretty relevant. It says like, so the tabernacle, that's like where God lived, right? His home. It became a unit. The Hebrew word there is echad. What does echad mean? It means one. It has everything to do with unity, right? And uh, I think you could establish pretty clearly based on the apostolic writings that we are a tabernacle of God. Like he dwells in the midst of his people and his glory. And it's from that place that he reveals himself to the world, right? So what preceded him coming in his glory and taking up his residence in the tabernacle? It became a unit. It became one. It became a chad, right? Could it be that, like, as he, as he gathers us in the body of Messiah, as we find that place of unity in his spirit, that that's when his glory will come? Is that something we could gather from this? I think so. There are a couple things that preceded the tabernacle becoming a unit. Uh, let, let's look at those together. Um, firstly, it says in that verse, like, he joined the curtains to one another. And uh, the Hebrew word there for joined is the verb chavar. Everybody say chavar. chavar. Um, that's like, okay, you know what a, chav, a chaver is in Hebrew? A chaver is a friend. It's like a, a discipleship partner, that kind of idea, right? Um, you had asked about that word, like a chavura is like a discipleship group, right? Like the Pharisees, for, for example, here's an example from history, they had chavuras. They had like groups where they challenged each other and taught to get, they, and they, uh, they prayed together and stuff like that, right? So that's the same word there. So something that preceded the tabernacle becoming a unit so that the glory of God could come was there was this connection that happened, this friendship that happened. And maybe, maybe that doesn't seem like much, but it's huge in terms of like how that applies to us. It just means like getting together as community, connecting with each other, giving each other a call if you feel prompted, just call each other up and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, doing lunch together like every single week. Really, like that friendship happens in context like that. And it's not just because we enjoy great meals, although I do, and because I love being with you all. It's because like this is part of preparing a place for his glory. Yeah. I think Anna. Also- Yeah, that's correct. So the body, you know, the head, the tail, the hands, the feet. Mm. And we, we can't operate without each other. Mm. Excellent. That's an excellent insight. Yeah. Um, even Facebook. Facebook seriously can be, and I'm not encouraging anyone to get on Facebook, but like Facebook can be an excellent tool for staying in touch with people throughout the week, for havaring with each other, right? Maybe I'm stretching it too far, but maybe even that can be part of that becoming echad, like staying in touch, being, being one, and see, so we can see his glory come. Maybe I'm stretching it. But anyway, like, you know, things like that. Like, it seems normal, but it's part of, like, preparing for his glory. Um, all, there's one other thing. This really hit me. Uh, where's that verse? I think it's in the verse before that. I didn't write down the reference. Anyway, there's this place where it talks about some of the articles in the tabernacle, like connecting with each other and um, accepting each other. Like the Hebrew word is like to, uh, to receive or to accept. And could it be that that's another part of becoming one? Like accepting each other. Like Paul, in Romans 15, he said, guys, accept each other just like Messiah accepted you. How, how, how has Messiah accepted you? Does he accept you and then, so he can like nitpick some of your character flaws or tell you things about you that annoy him or, like, 
this is probably the thing that's really hit me on a personal level this week. I've been thinking, asking myself this like throughout the week, like, how has Messiah accepted me? You know, I don't know. Like sometimes I, I think I have like I have pretty high standards of excellence and things like that. No worries. And so sometimes like I, I think I can be pretty action oriented. And sometimes I don't know. I think I might be out of touch. Per, like sharing very honestly, I think I might be out of touch with how Messiah has accepted me. There's, there's such a security in that. Like he has accepted you 100%, who you are, right now. He accepts you. You know, and when when we like really receive that and we like relate to each other in that capacity, we become echad, we become one. And um, we're, laying the, we're laying the ground for it, work for his glorious presence to come. That's what I get out of that. Trying to pull some practical stuff out of this chapter, right? All this tabernacle stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, we had talked also a couple of weeks ago, we did this like drama up here about the cherubim on the ark. And uh, we talked about how the Hebrew word for the cherubim is very closely related to the Hebrew word for drawing near or coming close. Um, it kind of makes sense. The cherubim were like about as close to, to God as you could get. They were like right over top of him. They had their wings around the glory, however that works, eh? And um, what's that? Peeking over his shoulder. Yeah, like peeking over his shoulder, right? And uh, so we were talking about how that can be a picture of us when we draw near to God, we come close to him in worship, we gather around his glory, we see each other through his glory, just like the cherubim saw each other through the glory over the, the mercy seat, picturing Yeshua's atonement, right? Um, there, there's, a, there's a really cool expression about the, the Kruvim, the cherubim, in this passage in Exodus 37, verse 8. It says, um, He made the cherubim with the mercy seat at the two ends. In Hebrew, like it says, min ha kaporet, asa et ha kruvim. It literally says, like, from the atonement, from that mercy seat, he made the cherubim. So they were actually an extension of the mercy seat. They were part of the atonement. And what, what does that tell us about worship? Like, if the cherubim, symbolizing coming close to God in worship, if the cherubim come straight out of the atonement, like symbolizing like Yeshua's sprinkled blood and the, the brutal sufferings that he underwent for us. Could it be that like when we really focus on our Savior's passion, like the sufferings that he underwent for you, could it be that your natural response will be worship? Could it be that if your heart, you feel your heart growing cold, and I feel my heart growing cold every, every week, it's a constant thing, right? Could it be that when we, when we come back to the gospel, and we remember that I sinned so much, and he died on my behalf, and he forgave me of so much, could it be that thinking along those lines, what the mercy seat represents, will, will rekindle that fire of love in your heart, will draw you close to him again? I don't know. Do you think that could be a practical application we could draw from this? I know it's true in my life, um, you know, last, last year for Yom Kippur, um, the Day of Atonement, I never watched The Passion of the Christ. I don't do things because they're trendy. I, I felt like Yeshua was inviting me to watch that with him. I don't know. I'm not like, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm like, you know, I'm pretty careful about what I watch generally, but I, I watched that for Yom Kippur because it's the Day of Atonement, right? Yeshua is like, sufferings are all about atonement. Oh, I feel like crying right now. I hope I don't start. Anyway, but like, it was just, it, I've never loved him so much. You know, like, I've never worshipped him like that. Like, I just walked down our driveway. It was, I think it was raining, and it was like 11.30 or 12 at night, and I was fasting because it was the Day of Atonement. I just bawled, like, like where your stomach hurts, you know, and you're glad that you live in the country because people would call the cops because they'd think someone's dying, you know? Like, like I just bawled, and I was like, Yeshua, I just... I just want to be so centered on the gospel. I never want to forget your sufferings. This is what I'm all about. You know, this is why I worship you. So I don't know. If there's ever a time when you feel like you're hitting the lukewarm or the cold mark, you know, go back to the, go back and focus on Yeshua's sufferings when he did for you. Jesus. Yeah. And you will worship him in, in response. So that's what we can learn from the cherubim. These guys have a lesson for us. Um, here, here's something else cool. Exodus chapter 38, verse 3. Um, Wrong verse. Anyway, okay, there's a place where it says that he made, uh, there it is, verse 8. Moreover, he made the laver of bronze. Okay, that's the word, the word there is for sink, okay? He made the bronze sink with its base of bronze from the mirrors of the serving women who served at the doorway of the tent of meeting. I love this verse. 
if you are a woman, you will love this verse too. Um, Because it's just really cool. The Hebrew word there for served is the Hebrew verb tzava. Everybody say tzava. Tzava. Um, It's uh, the plural is tzavaot. Um, You know how God is called like Yahweh tzavaot? What does that mean? Yahweh, like he's the Lord of armies, right? Tzava is an army. Like the modern Hebrew word for the army in Israel is tzava, right? So the word here, it's translated as serving women and served, which is really lame because it's the word for serving in the military. It's the word for being in the army. So there was like this army of women who served in this place of worship. I just think that's, po- that's powerful imagery. So like if, if, if you're a woman, you're worshiping God in your prayer, that is military duty. You are on the front lines. Like when you, when you get down and you start praying, you just got your combat boots on, right? That, that, like you're getting dangerous. So um, cut loose in prayer. You know, like go for it in prayer. Go for it in worship. Like when you worship, he's enthroned on your praises. His presence comes. And that, like, that gives demons the boot. That brings light to regions, right? So that's, that's one cool thing. The other interesting thing is that this sink, which is a place where you look into it, it's like, oh man, like I've got a big blood spatter on my face from the last lamb we sacrificed or whatever. It's kind of what the priest would use it for, right? It was like a mirror, right? It was polished, this bronze thing. So you look into it, you see a reflection, and then you know where to wash off. And this is very true in my relationship with Genevieve. She is my mirror. If I ever have like a little dirt spot on my face or whatever, you know, right? My mom did that too. Oh, that was the worst thing ever growing up, right? So I don't know, how many of you got that from your mom growing up? <laughs> Just like rub it all over your face. It's like, stop. I have, I have boundaries here. You know, don't do this to me. It kind of grossed me out. Anyway, but it was, it was all for the best. I'm not too traumatized, although I... Yeah, anyway, now my wife does it to me, so it's just part of being a male, I guess, right? It's what you get when you don't look in the mirror and wash your own face or whatever. But I mean, so like on a humorous level, that's true. Like, you know, your mom and then your wife, are they're like your mirror. But on a deeper level, do you think that could be true too? Um, let, let, let's look at that in a couple of different, uh, different areas. Like, uh, so it's with these mirrors of, that the women had that the sink was made, the place where you would look in and see your reflection, the place that would, where you would be cleaned up, Right? Uh, could this be true on a deeper level? What about, what about in society in general? Could it be that like the state of women in society reflect where the men are at? So if like the women are, are suffering and depressed and abused or are just out of control and angry, could it be that it's actually the men's fault? Could it be that the problem lies with the men and they're not being who God is calling them to be and the women are going bonkers as a result? Could it be? I think it's true. Women... The women in a society reflect the state of the men. I, I, I think that's a, a general spiritual law. I, I think that can often be the case in marriage too. I, I know like, here, here's an example in my life. If I'm off spiritually, if I'm a little spiritually cold, if I may be a little, a little harder or more impatient than, than Messiah was in his, you know, like if I'm not reflecting Messiah to my wife, she will reflect that very, fa- very fast, my spiritual state, you know? The, the light will go out of her eyes. She will just not be doing well. She'll not have a good day. And our life just kind of goes down the tubes because I'm not connecting with the Father. I'm not staying humble. I'm not letting Yeshua's life come through me, etc. right? So in, in the marriage, very often, the woman will be the mirror of the man and how he's really doing. Well, in my opinion, the Women's Live movement is a reaction to men having dropped the ball and failed the females of, in their societies. That, that's my opinion. Um, I, I think maybe that's the heart of it. There, there's pain there. There's, there's disappointment. Here, here's another cool example. Um, okay, you know like the sun, the sun often pictures the masculine and the moon pictures the feminine. Um, you know, like in some very obvious ways. Um, here, here, here's, um, here's one way like, okay, so the sun is really regular, right? He's up every morning at the same time, really stable you know, rational. And, and then the moon, like, she's just all over the place, right? You get up in the morning, oh, there's the moon, you know, and then it's not coming up at another time, and it's all over the place whenever you walk outside, right? It's really unpredictable and not stable, right? I'm totally joking, of course. <laughs> but that's, um, that's a humorous example. But, I mean, it, it is true that the moon reflects the sun. 
The moon is a reflection of the sun. So, you know, you could see that the moon is the mirror of the sun. And uh, there's some connections you could make there. Let, let's just say in terms of us as the bride of Messiah, Yeshua is like the sun. He's the son of righteousness, right? He's like uh, the bridegroom who's going forth from the bride chamber just like the sun comes up in the morning, like it says in Psalm 19. And uh, we're, we're like the moon, you know, um, even Israel. There's some fascinating correlations between the people of Israel and the cycles of the moon. And I'm not going to get into all those details right now. But um, if we are like the moon as the bride of Messiah, then what's our job? To reflect the light of the sun. That's right. We shine. We shine with his light. Maybe that's why Yeshua could say, I'm the light of the world in one place. And in another place he says, you're the light of the world. It's like we have this union with Mashiach so that his light reflects through us, eh? I love that. Here, here, I'll just give you a couple more keys in brief here about like what the people of Israel did before the glory came because it's very, it's very pra practical for us too. Um, what, did, what do you think the most recurring phrase is in this parasha? Like it's, it's plastered all over chapter 40. Um, that's right. As the Lord commanded Moses, it's like, they did da-da-da as the Lord commanded Moses, and they did da-da-da as, as he commanded them. So, what do we get out of that? What Charlotte had said earlier, like when we do what he's called us to do, when we obey his commands, that is preparing for his glory. There's a, that's, that's thinking in terms of the big picture, right? I counted it, and it's eight times that it says that. You counted? I thought about counting, eight but times, I... Eight, eight times. Wow. Right. Okay, and new beginnings. When did the glory come? It says they set up the tabernacle and the glory came, Exodus chapter 40, verse 1, on the first day of the first month in the second year after they came out. So it's like, it's the new beginning, hey? The second year, yeah. So I, I see a real connection there. Like the second year, it's like a connection with the new covenant, the second covenant. It's through the new covenant that his glory comes. Yeah. Also, the, where it says that the tabernacle was raised, the Hebrew word there is hukam, and it's the word for resurrection. So it's like the tabernacle was resurrected, is what it's saying, eh? And you just think about Yeshua. He's like the ultimate tabernacle. Like in him, the fullness of deity dwells, eh? And Yeshua was resurrected. And we read in Corinthians, like, like Paul, you know, he says, you are in Yeshua. And just as God raised Yeshua up with his power, he's going to raise you up too. He is raising you up. So I just, I just see those connections with being raised up as we experience that in our lives and, and his glory coming. Yeah. So let's look at a couple things from Paul's letters. Paul's letter here. Um, we didn't read the whole passage, of course. We, hopefully we all read that at home. But one of the things Paul says is that um, he talks about how there's like the, the Corinthians were falling for this, this other Jesus. It's like they were, having this, um, they were having some mistaken identity going on. So I wanted to read you a, a short account about mistaken identity. Um, after directory assistance gave me my boyfriend's new telephone number, I dialed him and got a woman. Is Mike there? I asked. He's in the shower, she responded. Please tell him his girlfriend called, I said and hung up. When he didn't return the call, I dialed again. This time a man answered. This is Mike, he said. You're not my boyfriend, I exclaimed. I know, he replied. That's what I've been trying to tell my wife for the past half hour. <laughs> so she got the wrong number. It was a case of mistaken identity, right? Caused some problems. All right. Here's a, let, let's look at that verse together. Um, 2 Corinthians, if you want to toggle over there. So um, he says in verse 2, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, he says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, so that to Messiah I might present you as a pure virgin. But I am afraid that as the serpent, serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Messiah. And I, I looked up that word for like simplicity there. It's, the, it's like uh, the Greek word 572 in the Strong's. It's ha, ha, plot, ha plotes, And it means like literally single. Single. Like if you have a, if you're single-minded or if you have like a single focus. 
That's the idea here. So Paul was afraid for this community. He was afraid that they were going to get distracted from just having a single-minded focus on Yeshua. Has that ever happened today? Has that ever happened in the Messianic Jewish world? Oh, yeah, there are lots of things to distract us from just focusing on Yeshua and having, like, a simple devotion to Him. And, um, man, seriously, if you ever think I'm getting distracted, like, if you ever think I'm getting off focus from Yeshua, just tackle me, okay? Or, like, come and talk to me, pray for me, and, and I'll do the same for you, but, like, let's keep each other really strong in this area of just being passionate followers of Yeshua, of having that single-minded focus on Messiah, hey? Like, like I've said many times, the Hebrew word for crown, like the name of our community is crown of Messiah. That's, what we, that's the name we felt he was giving us. And the Hebrew word for crown means to be, to be going around something, to be surrounding it, right? So what that means for us as a community is he has called us to be all about him, to gather around him. And if we're ever like getting off base, like let's just put the brakes on everything and refocus, right? Yeah. You think about a girl before, you know, she's engaged and she's going to be married. Like, who does she think about all day long? Right? We are engaged to be married to Yeshua. And, like, we are in love with him. We are waiting for him. We think about him all the time. I mean, really, wouldn't it be weird if, like, a girl was engaged to a guy and she was talking with her friend and it was, like, a week before the wedding and she was talking about all this stuff and she didn't even mention him once? Be like, man, you're not very in love or, like, you're distracted or something, eh? I mean, man, like, we do that all the time, you know? Like, take, God, take our pulse on that sometimes, yeah. Here's something scary. Uh, the next verse, he says, okay, if someone comes and preaches another Jesus whom we haven't preached, or you receive a different spirit which you haven't received, or a different gospel which you haven't accepted, you bear this beautifully. He's being a little sarcastic there, right? It's just, it's something to take note of. There are rivals out there who will come in the name of Jesus, but they're not really him. There are even demonic spirits that pose as Jesus. Isn't that weird? So how, how, how do we tell? How do we tell if it's really him? If it's really the Holy Spirit? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's true. The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus. So the true prophetic spirit will point to him. Like you said, what does it say in John? Every spirit that's from God will like, confess Yeshua. Came in the flesh specifically. Mm -hmm. that he died uh, and that he was resurrected. Right. Because um, uh, Satan hates the fact that he was resurrected. Right. He, he won the battle. The battle was won at the cross. Mm. You know. Yeah. You know, about, about 10 years ago, I'll, I'll tell you a story. About 10 years ago, I was, I was beginning to really recover my Jewish heritage, um, come back to kind of a, a discipleship in, um, in a Jewish, uh, Jewish parameters. So I, uh, I was at this bookstore downtown, and they had this big sale on books on Judaism and uh, things like that. So I ordered, like, a ton of books, right? Because I was on this quest to know Jesus as, like, the Jewish Messiah that he was and is. It was just this side to him that I didn't know, right? Coming from an evangelical background. So anyway, I had this, like, stack of books, like, this tall. It almost killed me carrying it in my backpack. And anyway, I went, uh, I went down, um, down a couple blocks to uh, this coffee shop where a couple friends of mine worked, right? And I knew the owner, too. She was a really nice lady. Um, I think it was Strong Arm. I think that was the name of the coffee shop. And uh, so I walked in, and she's like, you have a huge pile of books. What are those? The owner of this coffee shop. And I was like, yeah, like all these books on, you know, the Jewish, uh, Jewish tradition of prayer and how, how Jewish people do um, community life, books about Torah, stuff like that, right? So I was showing her these, and she's like, why are you reading about all this? And I said, you know, I just, well, Jesus was a Jew, and I want to know him better. I want to understand Jesus better, right? And she turned and looked at me. She gave me the funniest look, and she said, oh, yeah, he was Jewish, wasn't he? I never thought about that before. And I just thought, man, how far have we come as the body of Christ? We've come a long ways in a couple thousand years. You know, Jesus, he loved the Torah. He went to synagogue his whole life. Um, he did stuff like wearing a prayer shawl that had fringes on the corners and stuff. He had a beard, you know? He wasn't like a white Caucasian. And yet, and yet we have, you know, in some ways we've misrepresented him. The, the world has forgotten that we serve a Jewish Messiah. And that, that has been catastrophic in the church's attempts to reach out to the Jewish people. Because, you know, the, 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 the Jesus that is presented to the Jewish people historically 
has been a very Gentile figure and someone who generally doesn't like them and who wants to take them and basically do, and destroy them like Hitler. You know, if you take the Jewish people and you convert them to Christianity, you've just accomplished Hitler's objectives very smoothly. You have destroyed the Jewish people. And I, that's not what God wants, obviously, right? And, and so, like, that's something I love. In the last century, like, you know, there's this, this awakening. People are realizing God loves Israel. God, God wants the Jewish people to come to Jesus and keep being Jews and glorify God as Jews. We don't have to be Gentilizers and make them into Gentiles, right? That's kind of the idea. And so, you know what? I, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, like, have we almost gone after another Jesus sometimes? Have we almost, like, portrayed the wrong Jesus? Even, let's say, to the First Nations people. Sometimes I think it was another Jesus that was portrayed to the First Nations people in the residential schools. That was not the Spirit of God. It was a demonic spirit, right? And, and, and you know what? God's name is holy. Yeshua is worthy of having a good reputation in this world and being known for who he is. And you know what? The Father, I believe the Father has an agenda to restore honor to his name, to show the world who his son really is. And of course, that's not just about showing the world that Jesus was a Jew, but maybe it's part of it. Maybe it's part of it. It's a big theme in the academic world, too. One of the top ten themes, in the, like the hot topics in the academic world, according to the New York Times, is the Jewishness of Jesus. Like, scholars are really into this, too. They're like, wow, Jesus was Jewish. This is fascinating. You know, so... That he was, he was a Jew, right? Well, you just think about it. Like, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. The guy didn't go down into the tomb a Jew and, like, come up a Gentile, right? I mean, he, he's the savior for all nations. He speaks every language on the planet. He created them, right? So, I'm, I, I, like, I'm not, I'm not a racist, right? I'm just saying I feel like we've missed a vital element of who he is and who he's going to be coming back at. Just think about it, like a billion people in this world worship a Jew. <laughs> it's kind of a compliment to the Jewish people, actually, as I see it. Uh, upon the Jewish community is that I have called you to be a royal priesthood, a chosen people. Right. And they are to represent the priesthood and the image of God mm. to the world. Mm -hmm. So that's their job. Amen. And that's something we support. Here's something cool. Um, Paul, he, um, I don't know, if they like rated him in terms of how pastors are rated today, I think he would have flunked some, some areas. They would have been like, Paul, you need, we need to send you to seminary. Like, you're messed up, buddy. You know, you are just really not, not very competent. Here, here's an interesting example. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10. This is what people were saying about Paul. This was word on the street about Paul. His letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive. And his speech is contemptible. It's like, you know what? The way this guy communicates is a joke. That's what people were saying about him. Like, this guy, was, this guy isn't a dynamic leader at all. That's kind of the idea here, hey? It gives us this glimpse into, like, Paul. So you can tell he wasn't relying on personal charisma. He wasn't relying on oratorical skills. He never went to seminary and, seminary and learned to, like, have a really crisp, smooth voice. Although I love guys who do. Like, Cherie's dad... How many of you have talked with Cherie's dad? Oh, he has the best voice ever. Seriously, like, your, your dad was like a radio like, announcer for all, wasn't he? I, like, I love talking with him just because he has the best voice. And that's cool, but as you can see from Paul, you don't necessarily need that to get the job done. Right? So, I don't know. Paul, I don't know, he probably would have flunked preaching class in seminary based on those criteria. I don't know. Here, here's a, also in 11 verse 6, it says virtually the same thing. He says, even if I am unskilled in speech, I'm not so in knowledge. So be encouraged. It doesn't matter how well you think you can talk or not talk. God's just going to say what he wants to you. Just let him do it. And you know what? You can grow in knowledge. Grow in your knowledge of God. Grow in your personal relationship with Yeshua. And that's going to overflow. That's, that's what I get out of that from Paul. Um, here is a really scary warning to the Messianic Jewish movement. Um, so, like, starting in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 22, he's like, okay, so there are these people out there in the early Yeshua movement, and they are like, they have certain things they really tout as being impressive. Like, these are, this is stuff they really boast about, right? Some things like, yeah, I, I'm a Hebrew speaker is the first one, okay? And then they're like, yeah, I'm an Israelite, was the next one, right? And then the next one was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a child of Abraham. I'm a genuine, certified, 
son of Abraham. And actually, like, in that time, that was the term for convert, right? If you converted to Judaism in the Second Temple era, then your Hebrew name would be so-and-so son of Abraham or so-and-so daughter of Abraham, uh, contingent on your gender, of course. So they they were like people around strutting their stuff, right? And you know what? Sometimes I fear that we do that in the Messianic Jewish community. I mean, God is restoring us to value the covenants— He is restoring us to appreciate our identity, that whether we be Jew or Gentile, we are included in Israel. We are grafted in. All of those things, right? That's important. It's something the Holy Spirit is emphasizing. But in the middle of that, we can become so obsessed with that and take pride in that, that we miss the point. Yeshua is the point. What did Paul say? May I never boast in anything except Yeshua and his cross. I determined to know nothing among you except Yeshua and him crucified. You know, it's from Corinthians and Galatians. So, you know, in, in, in the joy that we experience in learning the Hebrew language and reconnecting with our Hebrew roots and discovering that we're part of Israel in a very practical and meaningful way, just make sure you keep Yeshua central. And don't start boasting about that stuff, right? Because, I don't know, Paul, he had all that stuff, right? And he didn't, he didn't think it was like, I don't know, it wasn't the... The center of the whole thing, yeah. Okay, um, we better wrap up here. I wanted to read you. There's one place here where he uh, he talks about the things that he's content with. He's learned to be content in Second Corinthians 12 with like weaknesses, insults, distresses, persecutions, difficulties, like all the stuff that we hate, right? All the stuff that gets us mad at God, like hard times when people treat you bad and they like say really mean things about you, Paul like said, you know what, I've learned to be content with that stuff because that's when God's power really comes through me. I just wanted to read you a a short story about contentment. So uh, a Jewish guy comes to uh, comes to his rabbi and he says, "Um, Rabbi, in my little apartment besides me and my wife, there are also my children, my six children and my mother-in-law and you know what, we're just so crammed. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm going to go crazy. What should I do, Rabbi? And the Rabbi says, um, Bring a goat into the house and let him live with you. And the guy says, But Rabbi, there's no place for me already. I can't bring a goat in the house. And the Rabbi says, Do what I told you. Bring the goat in the house and let the goat live in the house with you. So he does. So uh, anyway, the, the guy comes back in a month And he says, Rabbi, it's even worse now. This goat is so loud and it's even more crowded and he he chews on my pillow at night and he stinks. It's even worse. And the rabbi says, okay, get rid of the goat now. So the next guy, the next day the guy comes to the rabbi and he says, Rabbi, thank you so much. It's so good now. There's so much room in my apartment. It's wonderful. Oh, maybe it all depends on perspective, eh? <laughs> yeah, right. So let's just let's just leave with I'll leave you with this thought. Um, Paul in first second Corinthians thirteen he says, Don't you know Yeshua is in you? And he said, like, you're looking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me. So like that same Messiah, that same Christ is in you. He's in us as a community. And he's not silent. He's talking. He's going to talk through us. He's going to communicate to the world. So, isn't that exciting? I wonder how that's going to happen this week. Yeah. Thank you for joining us in this message. I pray that it's been an inspiration to you and your discipleship to Yeshua the Messiah. Crown of Messiah is a relatively small congregation with a massive mission. We're not just making disciples and teaching the Word of God here in our city. We're also doing that internationally through vehicles such as the Internet. It is our joy to offer you these messages for free at absolutely no charge. At the same time, we do have ongoing overhead expenses. It costs us something to produce these teachings and get them out to you. And we would appreciate it if you would, in turn, support our work in a practical way. Help us cover some of our basic expenses. You can do that by going to our website, crownofmessiah.com and going to the donate page where you can make a one-time donation or you can set up a monthly automated donation. 
I'm reminded of the words of Yeshua's Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6. He said, Let the one who is taught the word share everything good with his teacher. So, if you're being taught the word by us, we would appreciate it if you would take the words of Yeshua's Apostle seriously and make some type of return for the blessing that we are giving you for free. That way, we'll all be in it together and we will be a team accomplishing the mission that Yeshua has given us. And you will go from only being a receiver to also being a giver. If you're like most people, finances are tight. We understand that. Finances are tight for us too. That's why we need people like you to come alongside us and to back us in the work that Yeshua has called us to do. Thank you so much for making that donation at crownofmessiah.com and thank you for becoming a team member with us. We appreciate it.